Morning, I'm Raleigh Flynn. I'm the president of the Foreign Policy Research uh, Institute in Philadelphia. And this morning, we're going to be talking about U.S. relationship with Taiwan, a very important topic and an interesting year for Taiwan, who, um, in contrast to most of the rest of the world, has done pretty well this year. Um, and so we're also very pleased to have the director of FPRI's Asia program, Jacques Delisle, who's going to be moderating. Um, Jacques is a Stephen A. Cousin Professor of Law and Professor of Political Science and the Director of the Center for the Study of Contemporary China at the University of Pennsylvania. He's also an author. His most recent book being To Get Rich is Glorious, Challenges Facing China's Economic Reform and Opening at 40, which he co-edited with Avery Goldstein. And he's got a new book coming out. Um, Taiwan Under Psy, which is co-edited with June Tufel Dreyer, who is also an FBRI senior fellow. Um, a couple of uh, housekeeping notes before we get started. First of all, we will be going to Q&A about halfway through the program. So I encourage you to put your questions in the Q&A, the bottom of your screen, the Q&A box, uh, not the chat. We'll be putting some other things in the chat, such as some maps and uh, other links. Um, or if you have technical problems, tell us about that in the chat. But questions, please, in the Q&A. Otherwise, we might not see them. Um, finally, before I turn it over to Jacques, I want to thank our sponsors and our members. Uh, we depend on you. Uh, we can't bring these events and the important work FPRI does without your support. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jacques. <clears throat> thank you, Raleigh, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today, both our FPRI audience and some uh, friends from the Center for the Study of Contemporary China at Penn. We're in the first full day of the Biden administration, of course, and among the many foreign policy issues on the new administration's plate is how to deal with Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan, as our uh, audience, I'm sure, knows, occupies a special place in American foreign policy. Uh, it's an important economic partner, a high-tech uh, powerhouse and is linked to many global supply chains. It's a vibrant democracy uh, in East Asia and the Indo-Pacific where that appears to be becoming a more important feature in our foreign policy. And of course, it has an important security uh, dimension to it as well, particularly as US-China relations get more fraught and as Beijing has ratcheted up pressure on Taiwan, particularly since the current president Tsai Ing-wen won her first election victory back in 2016 and has just started her second term. There's a great deal to talk about here, and I have two absolutely terrific people to talk about it on our panel today. It's a great pleasure to welcome albeit virtually, uh, to FPRI, Bonnie Glazer, and Rupert Hammond Chambers. Bonnie is a senior advisor for Asia and the director of the China Power Project at CSIS, a real go-to website for all things uh, contemporary China. I recommend it to everybody who's listening. Uh, she works on Asia-Pacific security issues, focusing especially on China and on Taiwan. Uh, she's also a non-resident fellow at the Lowy Institute in Sydney, Australia, and a senior associate with CSIS Pacific Forum, which used to, I think, mean you got to go to Hawaii a lot, but probably not so much with uh, COVID travel restrictions. Uh, she was, she's also was the senior advisor to the Freeman Chair in China Studies at CSIS and a senior associate in the International Security Program, also at CSIS. Before that, she worked at a number of U.S. government uh, security-related agencies, Department of Defense, State, and so on. Uh, she's written widely on the topics we're going to be talking about today and on many others as well, including in the Washington Quarterly, China Quarterly, International Security, and major newspapers. Rupert Hammond Chapers is our expert on Taiwan's political and economic issues. He really bridges the gap between Taiwan's economic role and the sort of security-related issues uh, of the economy. Uh, he is the president of the U.S.-Taiwan Business Council. He's been the president there since 98. And before that, he was the vice president. Uh, he also serves as an associate for, at the Center for Security Policy, a defense and foreign policy think tank in Washington. He's also a member of the board of the Project 2049 Institute, another place that puts out a lot of really interesting stuff on Taiwan and related issues. Over the course of our conversation today, you'll find in the, uh, in the chat box some postings for links. One of the links will be to a report that we'll be talking about today, and I'll say a bit more about in a moment, as well as to some recent writings by our panelists here. Uh, all three of us uh, were part of a project that was uh, run by CSIS jointly with Brookings uh, to, to produce a report called Toward a Stronger U.S.-Taiwan Relationship. You'll find the, the link in the chat box. Here's what it looks like. We printed it out. Uh, it's a, a compact survey of how we got where we are in U.S.-Taiwan relations, and perhaps more importantly, where we think we should be going. 
That task force was chaired by Bonnie Glazer, along with Richard Bush of the Brookings Institution, who is, for anyone who follows Taiwan, a very well-known name, and also Michael Green, who's a, I think we can say, polymath Asia expert at CSIS and also at Georgetown University. I think there were a total of about 16 members of the task force. Rupert and I were both on it as well. Uh, so let me, uh, without further ado, turn to some substance here. And uh, let's start, I guess, with the big picture question for uh, those listening who may not be Taiwan junkies, uh, like most of the panel is, and, and throw it first to Bonnie to say, why is Taiwan and a strong U.S.-Taiwan relationship something that is an important U.S. foreign policy interest? Well, thank you so much, uh, Jacques, and, uh, and to um, uh, your organization, um, FPRI, for, uh, uh, for inviting me uh, today. And it's always a pleasure to be on a panel with uh, Rupert. You know, you start with what is really the most important question, of course. You know, why does Taiwan really matter to the United States? And, and Taiwan shares our values. Uh, as you said, it's a vibrant democracy. And its existence as a democracy stands uh, really in contrast to the authoritarian political system uh, in mainland China. Uh, and, and therefore it offers an alternative model of governance uh, to the Chinese who are living in mainland China. Um, I recall President George W. Bush called uh, China, called Taiwan a beacon of democracy. Uh, and I think that that is a widely shared view uh, in, in the United States and, and elsewhere in the world. Uh, Taiwan is also a partner in, in demonstrating and promoting democratic values. And, and democratic values are, I think, a competitive advantage for the United States in the geopolitical competition uh, with autocracies uh, like China and, uh, and Russia. Uh, I think Taiwan is also important because it's pivotal peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific. Um, it, it geographically sits at the center of the first island chain, which extends from Japan down through the Philippines and uh, into the, uh, the South China Sea. And if uh, the Chinese Communist Party ruling China were to actually occupy Taiwan, then that could result in uh, threats to sea lanes. Uh, and it would particularly endanger the security of our, our ally, uh, Japan. Uh, if Taiwan's security is not protected by the United States, I believe it could undermine the confidence of US allies um, in the region. That could result in countries like Japan, South Korea uh, going nuclear, for example. And then finally, I'd say Taiwan is just, just an outstanding diplomatic partner. It works with the US around the world to provide public goods. Um, uh, and uh, the US helps Taiwan to showcase its expertise in the world. Uh, because it is unable to participate very actively in many multilateral um, inter and international organizations. Uh, issues like uh, uh, cybersecurity, global health, media transparency. Um, these are areas where uh, China, where Taiwan, excuse me, is doing a lot of great work. And the US is uh, really conducting some sort of nascent cooperation on infrastructure projects in the Indo-Pacific with Taiwan. So that's, a, that's a, a, a maybe a brief uh, encapsulation of why Taiwan matters to the United States in the, in the areas that I work on in diplomatic and security. And uh, I'm sure Rupert can talk more about economics and technology. That's where I was going to head with that. Uh, Bonnie's covered a lot of the waterfront there. Uh, Rupert, you want to finish uh, sketching our map here? Uh, sure. Well, I, I would echo Bonnie's sentiment. It's it's always lovely to to double team with her on on uh, an issue as important to American national interest as Taiwan. And Jacques, thank you and Raleigh for for an FPRI for hosting this event. So uh, I think I, I would uh, wind back the clock to the late nineties. Uh, the last time I think where I, I would argue you'd seen the sort of support that Taiwan enjoys right now across the board. But that support 20 plus years ago was far narrower and much more embedded in the sort of history and relationship between the states and Taiwan and the nationalists that stemmed from the Second World War. Now what we have in the relationship between our country here in the US and Taiwan is a much broader and deeper relationship based on a whole range of shared values and interests. Bonnie uh, brilliantly just framed for you sort of the, the political side of, of, uh, of the inherent uh, partnership that exists between us, of course, embedded in Taiwan's decision in the, in the uh, 
in the late 80s and 90s to move decisively towards democracy. However, the, the economic relationship increasingly not isn't just economic glue in the sense of ex, in, in, in the ex, in the sense of an exchange of goods and services. There is a strategic uh, evolving strategic synergistic relationship economically that is hugely important. I think for the purposes of those who um, have decided to join us today, I would probably point to the semiconductor industry as, as, as the best example, but it's by no means the only example. Emerging 5G technologies is a hugely important area, high-speed, um, high-tech, um, uh, home-based communications and, and, and work um, accelerated by the pandemic has also uh, uh, really well positioned the Taiwan economy to impress upon the rest of the world, obviously here in the States, we're concerned about most, um, just how important Taiwan's manufacturing base is, its systems integrators, and the partnership they have with the world's leading technology brands, in fairness, most of which are American. Um, just quickly, I'd, I'd like to share with you a, a stat that came out just uh, today from the uh, DGBAS, the Director General for Budget and Statistics and the Ministry of Economic Affairs, Taiwan's export orders during the pandemic year grew by over 10%, the biggest spike in three years, and they're topping out at $534 billion. So even while uh, the pandemic has had a significant and dramatic effect uh, on the global economy and on the lives of, of, of uh, me many of the lives of our citizens, the Taiwan economy has thrived. And it has done so because it finds itself well, very well positioned um, to take advantage of some of the broader trends right now, um, economically and in the, in the technology space. I'll stop there and I'm sure we'll get into a bit more on tech as, as time progresses. Yeah, we certainly will. So as the Biden administration comes to office, they've got a pretty full plate of foreign policy issues. Many of them, I think, charitably described as challenges, some worse than that. Uh, but the U.S.-Taiwan relationship has actually been in pretty good shape. Uh, the previous president, Ma Ying-jeou, was fond of <coughs> saying during his tenure, which uh, ended in 2016, uh, that U.S.-Taiwan relations were the best they had been since before 1979, when the U.S. severed formal diplomatic ties with Taiwan and recognized the PRC as the government of China. Uh, and there have been some rough patches in between. Uh, Rupert alluded to uh, a relative high point before the late 90s, so we had some, some rough patches, but it's been uh, quite good since then. And uh, Ma's statement, I think, could be amplified uh, by current President Tsai. We've seen in the last few years a lot of strong shows of support for Taiwan and closer relations between the U.S. and Taiwan. Many pieces of legislation and alphabet soup, including ARIA and the Taipei Act and a number of other things, but really a lot of efforts that show bipartisan support in Congress and a number of moves from the administration, including higher level official visits, um, and indeed an 11th hour attempt to raise the cap even higher, and I know Bonnie has some views on that, uh, for the level of U.S. if you visit Taiwan. We've seen an uptick in arms sales as well. Uh, so in a sense, pretty good news for Taiwan. Uh, indeed, such good news that some people in Taiwan are worried about backsliding uh, under Biden. So I'd, I'd like to get your sense of what the change in administrations means at that fairly broad level for us Taiwan relations. Are things likely to remain as good as they have been? Uh, do we see uh, clouds on the horizon? Uh, Bonnie, do you want to start? There's a lot to unpack on there, Jacques, and, and I, I think you're correct, correct in highlighting that uh, there are people in Taipei who are worried about uh, the Biden administration. Uh, but uh, I think uh, that there really is no reason uh, for them to be concerned. Uh, uh, of course, any uh, transition that takes place in, in, in a uh, US uh, presidency is going to be of concern to uh, allies and, and, and partners around the world uh, because they may not get as much love as they got before. And, and Taiwan has gotten a lot of attention. It's been very, very high on the list of the Trump administration's priorities. That's one area where um, I think uh, there is uh, perhaps some basis for concern. And that is that uh, the Biden administration just has a, a, a lot of things on its plate, you know, beginning with a long list of domestic challenges. 
and uh, getting control of the pandemic and rejuvenating the U.S. economy and making the U.S. more competitive um, so it can uh, effectively uh, uh, deal with, with China and the challenges it, it, it faces going forward. Uh, but so, so Taiwan is, is very important, but it's also not a problem. And so I think getting the attention of high levels in, in the administration uh, and sustaining the pace of the things that the U.S. has been doing with Taiwan is the one area where I do think that there may be some um, basis for a bit of um, anxiety. But I want to highlight really the positives. There will be close cooperation on democracy, human rights, and values. Uh, these, these are going to be central to uh, Biden foreign policy. And uh, so Taiwan will uh, be working with the U.S. in, in many ways. Uh, there may be some cooperation on the group of 10 uh, democracies, the D10. Maybe Taiwan can play uh, some role there. Uh, if there is to be some kind of a uh, summit for democracy, even though the United States would not invite Taiwan as a sovereign state, it would certainly have a role to play. Um, some of the policies that uh, have, have been um, implemented by the Trump administration, I would say will continue under uh, Joe Biden, but uh, will be implemented in a, in a more sort of below under the radar way. Uh, for example, um, uh, the US Navy has been conducting transits through the Taiwan Straits for a long time and uh, the Trump administration has just made every one of those public. And they occur approximately um, uh, monthly. I think that the Biden administration will probably return to doing that more, more quietly. Uh, similarly, the US has announced virtually every dialogue we do with Taiwan publicly, including uh, a recent announcement about a uh, uh, the Paul Mill dialogue or political military dialogue. Well, of course, that's been taking place for a long time, but you know, just announced publicly. Even joint military exercises between the U.S. and Taiwan have been leaked. Um, so I, I just think that the Biden administration will return to a, a policy of doing things um, a bit more quietly um, without much uh, public fanfare. Uh, this, of course, does not mean that it will not do some things publicly because it's necessary to do so, I think, to provide reassurance to Taiwan and also to strengthen deterrence against China. Uh, but that doesn't mean you have to make everything public. And then I would um, emphasize uh, arms sales, which will certainly continue, right? I mean, they are required under the Taiwan Relations Act, and it's only a question of what will be sold and when. Uh, the Trump administration did sell a lot of uh, weapons and new capabilities, and Taiwan has therefore um, spent or allocated a lot of uh, funding, and, and I think needs time to absorb uh, the equipment. So perhaps major sales of uh, new weapons platforms will not be made um, in the first year, but there will certainly be um, arms sales. Um, and and uh, I, I, I think that um, the Trump administration, again, has started selling more um, clearly offensive capabilities. And it will be um, interesting to see whether the Biden administration uh, continues that practice. I think there is a, a widespread recognition of the, th the threats that China poses to Taiwan. And therefore, I think that the likelihood is, is high. Um, and then I would just highlight a couple of other things. Support for Taiwan's participation in the international community will be very high. Um, uh, there will be high level visits when there's a reason to do so, I think not for uh, symbolic reasons. And um, finally, I think very importantly, I believe that the Biden administration will adopt a policy of doing no harm to Taiwan. The Trump administration has on occasion used Taiwan as a cudgel against China. And a specific example would be the announcement of the planned visit by the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. Kelly Craft to Taiwan, which subsequently was canceled. But it was announced in a statement about how the United States uh, condemned China's practices towards Hong Kong and the arrest of politicians and pro-democracy activists. The announcement of 
the ambassador, Ambassador Kraft's visit to Taiwan in that context, in my view, um, was not in Taiwan's interest. It basically said the U.S. doesn't like what what you Beijing are doing in Hong Kong, so we're going to send a senior official to Taiwan. And I just think that the Biden administration is going to value very highly our intrinsic relationship with Taiwan, but just not use it as a weapon against China. And just to pick up on a couple of those threads, there is a a kind of dovetailing of other aspects of Biden foreign policy with some of the things that Bonnie's just talking about. So the re-emphasis on values, human rights, democracy as a matter of US foreign policy plays to one of Taiwan's strong suits. There was a, a response of, I think, great alacrity in Taiwan to the talk about reframing Pacific relations more in terms of alliances of democracies, the D10 and so on. Um, and of course, if you're talking about supporting Taiwan, having greater access to international organizations, it helps if you're not uh, downgrading and, and bailing out of those international organizations. You know, the idea that Taiwan should have greater access to WHO is an easier argument to make if the U.S. is in the WHO, uh, Human Rights Council at the UN and, and other such things. <clears throat> and as, as Bonnie quite rightly points out, of course, there's always this, uh, this uh, tension in Taiwan between wanting to have attention paid to it, wanting to be a high priority and, and, and worried about dropping down, versus not being uh, so much in the middle that they're at the risk of being a bargaining chip. And that was one of the concerns, I think, of the Trump era of lots of love, but are we going to get uh, compromised as some instrument to bash China or some, at earlier moments in the administration, some bargaining chip uh, for a U.S.-China deal, which, of course, became less and less plausible as we got farther into the administration. Um, so, so Rupert, what, what's your views on this sort of question? Where, where, where we think we're, um, we are at this moment and if there's a risk of backsliding uh, or, um, or, or what the assessment of what kind of shape we're in in the areas you watch most closely? You know, I, 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 I perhaps am I'm slightly more on my toes than, 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 than maybe I had uh, Bonnie on, on, on the incoming administration. I, 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 just a couple of thoughts. I, I, Bonnie makes a really interesting um, uh, insight on arms sales uh, in regards to uh, what uh, this incoming well, this administration, excuse me, I say incoming, they are they have arrived, um, uh, is, is is going to consider for Taiwan. Um, there are several programs in the pipeline at the moment. They are, in my opinion, not controversial. Um, but if we were to look at the last time there was a, a, a transition where things were in the pipeline, uh, we'd go back to uh, 09, and it took about a year. Um, for uh, uh, programs ready for notification to be notified. And it's not unreasonable, I think, uh, to, uh, um, to, uh, to appreciate the fact that for an incoming administration, it takes a wee while to get your people in, uh, get the, those who need to be confirmed into their positions to assess where, where we are in our bilateral and multilateral relationships and then make decisions. Obviously, uh, these are people who are, uh, one would hope, uh, extremely experienced in the portfolios they're inheriting. Uh, but nevertheless, I, I think it's it's not unreasonable to go into a quiet period now on something as as many would say as sensitive as arm sales. I think it's just as as, as arm sales go on. I, I think reasonably, um, uh, we it, it might be a few months, maybe even a couple of quarters before we see an arm sale. I would add one thing to to to, to Bonnie's note about the Trump administration and, and arm sales, it, and it, it was very important, but but I think less understood and appreciated. They, they fixed the process of arms sales as well after Mr. Bush's administrations and Mr. Obama administrations had contorted the, the, the process into an almost unrecognizable um, uh, mishmash of efforts to avoid selling arms. And we had long freezes and, and to avoid selling certain programs. It, it really, that needed a significant address. And it was. And now what, we, what Mr. Biden has inherited is a process that looks and feels like the, the, the approach that we take to providing security assistance for other friends and allies around the world. That's where it needs to remain. And hopefully we won't have the same p political um, uh, um, uh, 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 messing around behind the scenes with, with arms sales to avoid difficult decisions for fear that it will impact China relations. Um, well, I, I, I think one other thing I would add, but on, 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 a, on a big, on big picture front, um, one area that, that perhaps we'll talk more about in the next few minutes is how China policy will impact Taiwan. And uh, if I had an area of concern that I would want to share this morning, um, it, it's certainly that. Um, I, to, to, to dive down deeper, I'm extremely curious how Mr. Kerry's um, czar status on climate change 
um, and the obvious necessity, as he might see it, to engage the Chinese on this issue will play out in respect to Taiwan policy. For I believe that the Chinese uh, ha have uh, deep experience in dealing with the US when we engage on single issue foreign policy, as we did with Mr. Bush in his second term with the DPRK and Mr. Obama's second term with the Paris Accord and, and environmental and climate change policy. If the Chinese feel that there's leverage there, and I, I believe that they do, um, they, they will almost certainly make strong demands and concessions in other areas. Taiwan to me is at the top of the list. What will that look like? Um, when they're sitting around the table in the White House, how will that discussion go? What kind of weight will Mr. Kerry's views about the necessity of, a, of, a, of a, a, a whatever kind of deal he feels is needed to be made with the Chinese mesh with others around the table in the White House who may feel that the cost is too high? Um, I'm, I'm very curious to see how that, that, uh, that deb debate plays out. Well, thanks. The uh, well, let me shift over to the, the China issues uh, with the next round. I just want to say before we do that uh, that if you have questions or comments in the audience, please use the Q and A function. There are a few things in there already, but but feel free because we will in in a short while uh, be turning it over to your questions. So, so let me pick up on that. I and mean, Rupert essentially got into to what we could call bargaining chip 2.0, right? The concern in the in the uh, Trump administration was that. Taiwan's interests might be put at risk by Trump's desire for some kind of a trade deal, uh, some kind of transactional cross-issue area a trade off. One gets less of a sense of that in, in discussions about where the Biden administration is likely to head, with the exception that Rupert just points to, which is that the Biden administration folks have said uh, that they view China as a competitor, a potential rival and all that, but they will cooperate where they can. Uh, and climate change has been at the top of that list. There's also been some talk about public health, but that's probably a little harder. Uh, so, so Bonnie, how do you rate that, that concern that Rupert raised? It's the Taiwan, um, because it's not a totally you know, core or central concern of US foreign policy, that, that its interests might be uh, at risk in the pursuit of some other uh, bargained arrangement with China. I, I think that Rupert's concerns are, are reasonable. Um, I just think it's unlikely that the United States is going to cut a deal with Taiwan that would damage, um, uh, cut a deal with China, sorry, that would damage Taiwan's uh, interests. And I don't rule out that there might be uh, some delay in approving some particular uh, thing for Taiwan, holding a dialogue, making an arms sale, uh, uh, sending a, a, a delegation to Taiwan or something like that um, uh, because there is a perception that the timing isn't right and could negatively affect something we're doing with Beijing. And I share that concern uh, with Rupert. But I think at the end of the day that we will look back on uh, the Biden administration um, four or eight years from now um, and we will evaluate very highly what it has um, achieved uh, with Taiwan. We will we, I, I believe we will not see that there has been any damage to Taiwan's interests. Maybe uh, we won't uh, highly appraise every single thing that was done. There will sort of, you know, perhaps be some disappointments, uh, but I think this is going to be an administration that really wants to um, work closely with Taiwan, but in a way that is just less provocative uh, toward, toward China. And there's going to be some very early tests here. I believe that as a result of Trump administration policies toward Taiwan, that Beijing is right out of the box going to try and pressure the Biden administration to make concessions and to clarify its position. It may, for example, uh, demand that the Biden administration define its one China policy more clearly. Um, or um, uh, pledge more, more clearly that it will not uh, uh, pursue a two China's uh, policy, uh, get the U.S. to establish some uh, boundaries as to what really is an unofficial relationship with Taiwan and to not conduct our relations in official ways. And I believe that the Biden administration will stand firm, that it will not succumb to this pressure and it will be an early signal to China that the Biden administration will not be weak um, and it will not be forced to take positions 
because China insists that the United States respect its core interests. And I would say that because many of the individuals serving in positions in the Biden administration have served in the past in the Obama administration, that I think they learned some lessons from that period when the Chinese started to talk about respecting their core interests and forging a new type of great power relations between the US and China. So I think they're gonna be very sensitive to those kind of appeals um, and pressures from China. So for those reasons, um, I'm perhaps less worried than your critics. So as, as you point out, new administrations often create occasions for, for testing those. And it can come from both sides, of course. We've seen uh, Americans uh, unprompted, un, uh, shall we say, statements like uh, when Trump came to office about the one China policy, perhaps uh, being not so <laughs> embedded that it, it, it couldn't be changed. And, and uh, Bonnie just alluded to the uh, what looked to be perhaps a concession on language early in the Obama administration. So yes, experience will, will certainly help. We've also seen the Chinese side uh, try to test this. Well, um, we can continue on the parade of sort of um, possible problems before we turn to some recommendations for what we should be doing. Uh, I want to throw it back to Rupert for one of the other issues that comes up as a matter of concern on the Taiwan side, which is the U.S.-China trade war, for lack of a better term, the, the economic frictions between the U.S. and China, the steps toward decoupling in one form or another, uh, even if it's not a, a policy agenda item the way it was for some uh, elements of the Trump administration. <laughs> There is a talk of secure supply chains not being so dependent on Chinese sources. Uh, there is obviously the securitization of economic policies, uh, which you know, means limiting tech transfers, and, and we all know about this, or the chip limits and what that means for Huawei and ZTE and Taiwan's uh, estimable TSMC, which is an alphabet soup you can explain to our listeners. But, but how big is that, that concern that Taiwan could be harmed uh, by the fallout of the US-China economic frictions and, and treating the economy as a, a set of security issues. Uh, and are there any silver linings for Taiwan in that possibly dark cloud? Thank you, Jacques. Uh, first, if I may, I, I thought Bonnie's, what Bonnie just said was is 100% right. Uh, just to, to reiterate and underline that twice, just in case anybody didn't understand it. I think she is absolutely right about the, the Chinese coming at the Biden administration. And um, I, 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 I I, I genuinely hope she's right. I think particularly Mr. Pompeo's comment um, a few months past on one China um, and, and, uh, and, and, and Taiwan sovereignty, I, 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 I think they'll come really, really hard at that and see if they can, they can squeeze out of the Biden administration some walk back of that statement. But Bonnie's right on the money as far as I'm concerned. Um, to, to your question, Jacques, I, th I think uh, um, I would say that, that ta Taiwan's uh, doing an excellent job at the moment um, in respect to the U.S. Taiwan, the U.S. Pardon me, the U.S. China um, uh, 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 trade competition, uh, trade conflict, if you will, um, and that they are extremely well positioned. Uh, one of the things that the, the Tsai government and the Trump administration were well aligned on, the DPP and, and, and Mr. Trump's perspective on, on, on the over, is the over-reliance on China economically. Um, when President Tsai was elected, um, you know, if you're looking at Taiwan domestic politics, um, the, the uptick in it for the DPP as it sort of went up to the crescendo of her being elected into her first term was the, the disquiet over um, the, the economic engagement with the Chinese and the palpable sense amongst the majority of Taiwan citizens that Taiwan had overplayed its hand economically with China and become too reliant. And they were a sort of precursor, if you were, of, of, of what was what was the, the debate that was developing here in the States over exactly the same thing. And the balance between what's what's good in respect to trading with China and what's overreach. Um, and so Mr. Trump comes along and you've got Taiwan and, and the United States very much in sync from a policy standpoint over the necessity to take a hard look at just how uh, close to China one should be economically and particularly in respect to the reliance and supply chains. So we have seen a shift. Um, in Taiwan, what you've seen for the systems integrators and the tier two through six suppliers that supply to the systems integrators and, you know, our iPhones, for example, I'm sure everybody on, on the, the uh, in, 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 in this program have, have heard this story, but, you know, Honhai Foxconn um, is the systems integrator, TSMC makes the chips. And tier, tier two through six are a mishmash of, tier, of, of suppliers around the world, but many Taiwanese and Chinese suppliers 
um, who, who uh, supply components and parts that are integrated by Han Hai Foxconn in these massive factories. And then we consume these products. Taiwan is absolutely at the heart of that. And the, the acceleration of demand for those goods is, is reflective in the uh, data that I just shared with you earlier in, the, in, this, uh, uh, in, in our session this morning and is accelerating. Um, you've got a couple of other trends that I would, I would um, sort of highlight for you um, that I think are well positioned Taiwan or several other trends. Semiconductors, um, the move to fabulous production with TSMC pulling away from the pack um, in respect to the production of chips designed by companies around the world. Uh, their process technology is the best in the world. Intel has stumbled. Samsung is there, but falling steadily behind. And um, uh, the fabulous industry is so well positioned and Taiwan dominates the fabulous industry with TSMC at its core. The downside risk, Shuck, is that um, we are starting to see an, an, uh, an, uh, an emergence of an over-concentration of high-end manufacturing on Taiwan for this level of chip. And that brings into play all the different security concerns um, that uh, Bonnie, who's brilliantly positioned to comment on these sorts of things, might highlight in respect to, to the ability to get those goods and the, those, those products out of Taiwan. God forbid, should something break out in the strait like a blockade or something worse. So what we've seen uh, take place is um, TSMC's announcement last year in the springtime in May that they were going to establish a five nanometer facility in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, please note that Intel is already in Phoenix. Um, we have, an, uh, a, we have a, another cluster with Apple and, and uh, Samsung in Austin. Um, and you have TSMC committing initially to a five nanometer fab. But I, if, I were away, if I were a betting man and being Scottish, I like to hold on to my money, but if I was, um, I, would, I would put money on the fact that TSMC probably have larger ambitions for that site as time progresses, but also from a policy standpoint for the United States, it is critical for our security that we see an emergence of other concentrations of high-end manufacturing outside of Taiwan, that it is not singularly located in one place. Um, and obviously here in the States is extremely important. Uh, just a couple other quick things and then I'll wrap up. Um, uh, 5G, just generally, uh, 5G policy, I think um, Mr. Mr. Trump and his colleagues got that absolutely right. It's a pressure point on China. China is a massive importer of chips. Choking them off from access to high-end chips is an important pressure point from a policy standpoint. Very useful. Taiwan is obviously a big part player in that because of TSMC's prowess and access to TSMC's manufacturing. How will the Biden administration handle that? It's unlikely to change the rules that were put in place. But um, the, uh, the exceptions to the rules that the Commerce Department handle is not public information. So there's some very interesting decisions that can be made as time progresses on how much wiggle room the Chinese will get moving forward. And then just another outlayer position um, for those who may be looking to make some stock tips based on this morning's discussion. Um, we have uh, the emergence of the um, electric uh, vehicle supply chain. Taiwan has struggled to uh, position itself as a supplier for components for the regular automobile industry, whether the European one, Germany, France, and the UK, particularly, um, and here in the States, but it is crushing it with Tesla and uh, the supplying of components for Tesla's electric cars. Could that in the longer term, uh, as the supply chain shifts in the automobile and transportation sector to electric vehicles in the future, uh, shift Taiwan, um, provide Taiwan a solution in a space that they've traditionally wrestled to, to penetrate? Okay, thanks. We've got a lot of things in the Q&A, so I want to turn to that in a moment, but uh, uh, just uh, I, I do want to have a few minutes here to highlight some of the things in the report that was put out by the CSIS uh, Brookings Task Force. So if I could ask you each to just spend a minute or two on what you think are the most important policy recommendations, recommendations for possible, especially policy changes uh, going forward that would support this goal of a strong U.S.-Taiwan relationship that serves U.S. interests. Let me start with Bonnie. Thanks, Jack. I'll try to be brief. As you know, in the, uh, in the report, we uh, really wanted to provide some actionable recommendations, not just big uh, strategic ideas, but things that could actually be implemented by the, uh, by the Biden administration very quickly. So one of the things that we recommended, for example, um, is a, a G7 
Conference statement backing the restoration of Taiwan's uh, status in the World Health Assembly. Uh, obviously, Taiwan's exemplary performance in preventing the spread of COVID-19 um, is, is just uh, another reason why Taiwan should have a seat at the table. Uh, we also uh, endorsed um, uh, undertaking uh, a high-level and comprehensive review of Taiwan's security. Um, and, and considering this issue of uh, uh, our de declaratory policy on uh, whether the United States should maintain strategic ambiguity um, or adopt a position of strategic clarity, which would ultimately mean that the United States would say under all circumstances, it would come to Taiwan's defense. And right now uh, that is not our position. We don't say, it, it, and this is of course contingency dependent, but reviewing that um, and, and seeing whether there is a way uh, or a set of things that the US could do to strengthen um, both deterrence messaging and our deterrence posture. Um, I think uh, is, is quite important. Um, and uh, then um, uh, lastly, uh, I, would, I would emphasize our, um, our recommendations uh, to uh, assist Taiwan to expand its engagement with, uh, as I mentioned, the D10 group of leading democracies, um, and also strengthen coalitions with like-minded um, uh, countries. Uh, to, and, and, and take joint actions aimed at expanding Taiwan's participation in key international organizations. And of course, one of the most successful mechanisms that was developed under the Obama administration was uh, the Global Cooperation Training Framework. And that is a series of workshops that started out just between the US and Taiwan uh, to highlight and share Taiwan's expertise in a number of areas. But Trump administration has very effectively multilateralized what we call the GCTF. Um, and I hope that the, uh, by, that the uh, Biden administration will, uh, will continue that process uh, because it is a way that is outside of the, uh, uh, the formal official uh, multilateral institutions and UN affiliated organizations um, to really help promote Taiwan's voice and participation in the international community. Great, thanks, and Rupert? Uh, uh, a, a couple of thoughts, um, one, um, that uh, the, 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 the significance of a normal, regularized arms sales process, uh, non-politicized, where uh, Taiwan's requests are assessed on their merits. Um, and I, I think that's, uh, that was an essential, there was a lot of work put in that by, uh, under Richard and, and, and Bonnie's leadership. And I, I, I think that's a really important part of the report. Uh, so I, I, I'd certainly stress that. Um, I, I think um, on the on the on the economic side, uh, uh, you know, the, the intersection between policy and business, uh, the, stressing the U.S.-Taiwan economic partnership again, not just in respect to the exchange of goods and services, which of course is important. Um, I certainly would argue that that the trade can and is net net benefit to the two sides. It's not it, you know it doesn't have to be one side wins, other side loses. Although that certainly can be the case at, at times, China. But um, uh, I think that uh, with Taiwan, um, stressing the areas that, 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 are, that really are emerging as strategic uh, uh, partnerships for us. Um, uh, obviously we've touched on chips, 5G, the health ecosystem. Taiwan is very well positioned as, as you noted, Jack and, 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 and Bonnie noted, given Taiwan's exemplary performance, uh, ongoing performance, pardon me, uh, during the, uh, the, the pandemic. Um, and then I think uh, the, the report also touches on some of the challenges, but also hope for opportunities in structured trade liberalization. In other words, structured engagement between us and Taiwan. The, uh, the Trump administration launched last year the Economic Prosperity Partnership Dialogue. Uh, that is a, a platform, certainly within the business community, that we have significant hope for. Uh, there are some uh, uh, working level meetings coming up um, in the coming weeks on uh, technology. And my hope is that the Biden administration really embrace this as an opportunity, not to circumvent USTR, although sometimes I feel that way, um, but to um, certainly to engage Taiwan in, 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 in discussing how can we prove, uh, improve R&D? How can we strengthen those strategic uh, 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 sectors in our economy that, that really are important to both? Uh, chips, 5G, health ecosystem, energy is another one as Taiwan moves aggressively towards renewables. Um, the, e the EPP is a, a tremendously important platform and, and our hope is that the Biden administration will take that and really run with it. And then on the, on the USTR front, 
that our friends and colleagues at USTR uh, uh, might take a, a, a somewhat more uh, um, flexible position on Taiwan than we have seen over the last four to five years, uh, particularly on agricultural issues. Now, the Taiwan administration has moved out on pork and beef, and that at a minimum, we might see the relaunch of the very modest Taiwan uh, the uh, Trade and Investment Framework Agreement, TIFA, um, and that aspirationally, there may be some opportunities for um, some more modest agreements, such as double taxation and investment, where there is strong business support and a strong business case uh, for, uh, again, smaller, perhaps less ambitious agreements than a bilateral trade agreement, which we'd love to see um, in the long term, but candidly, I think is unreasonable in this economic climate. And, and Mr. Biden, in, in fairness to him, has been quite clear that a, a bilateral and multilateral trade agreements are not at the forefront of his uh, consideration, um, at least in the early to, to middle stages of, 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 of his term in office. Okay, well, uh, thank you both so much. I, uh, we have tons more we could uh, pursue down those various lanes, but I want to get to some of the things that have come in in the chat function. Uh, there's uh, a couple of, of points that, that sort of reinforce the discussion of how strong the U.S.-Taiwan relationship uh, is, and I'll uh, quote from our friend Michael Fonte, the DPP, the Democratic Progressive Party rep in, um, in uh, Washington, who points out uh, that the spokeswoman for the National Security Council said the U.S. commitment to Taiwan was rock solid, uh, and that, of course, Ambassador uh, Shelby Kim attended uh, the inauguration, uh, and uh, that we uh, have a statement that President Biden will stand with friends and allies to advance our shared prosperity, security, and values in the Asia-Pacific region, and that includes Taiwan, uh, which, which I think speaks to a broader point that we've seen some pre-Biden elements of. Uh, and I'd like to throw this to Bonnie. One of the issues, of course, has been how do you fold Taiwan into the U.S.'s Indo-Pacific security uh, strategy? I mean, it's obviously not a formal uh, security ally, hasn't been since the termination of relations, uh, saying anything too openly about how much Taiwan is part of the uh, alliance or quasi-alliance structure that takes in formal allies like Korea and Japan and then more informal friends. How much has Taiwan's uh, inclusion in that security thinking or perhaps more narrowly the public statement of that security thinking uh, transformed and do you see it, uh, do you see Taiwan being more securely entrenched in that uh, vision of, of how the U.S. approaches security issues in the Western Pacific and the Indo-Pacific? So Jacques, I think this is an area where we probably will see some modification of the Trump administration's approach. And I think that there will be more emphasis on um, action, things that we are doing with Taiwan, um, including in the Indo-Pacific, um, and less on the rhetoric. Uh, the rhetoric of the Trump administration was to explicitly say that Taiwan is part of our Indo-Pacific strategy in the June 2019 report that was released by the Defense Department uh, to, uh, it, it was, Taiwan was included in a category with Singapore, Mongo Mongolia, and New Zealand and referred to as a country. Um, and uh, I, I just think that those kinds of rhetorical statements will be less prominent in the Biden administration. But I think that there will be continued cooperation with Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific. As I said, the global cooperation training framework being one example. Um, uh, I hope that the Biden administration will build on this agreement with Taiwan to cooperate in infrastructure building. Um, and there's already been some collaboration with uh, Japan and Taiwan in uh, Palau, uh, because Palau is one of uh, Taiwan's 15 remaining uh, 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 diplomatic allies is uh, what they call it, their, their partners. So um, I, I think that there will be very specific ways that the U.S. and Taiwan can work together in the Indo-Pacific strategy. But my guess is that there will not be um, a, a very explicit statement that says that Taiwan has a role to play in our Indo-Pacific strategy. But it, it, I, the, the other way to put it, which I actually that some people in the Trump administration did, and, and you can find this in, in other documents, um, is, is to say that our strategy is synergistic with the strategy of many other um, actors, players, and countries uh, in the region. So we have Taiwan's New Southbound policy, of course, 
Um, and then we also have what well, Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific. I think the Biden administration is going to call it secure and prosperous Indo-Pacific. And then we have the southern policy of uh, South Korea. Um, India has, you know, sort of its own look east uh, and act east policy. So in that regard, I think that Taiwan um, can, um, uh, its policy will, uh, will be um, uh, alongside the other policies of the region will be important to advancing uh, American interests in the Indo-Pacific. Okay. Uh, Rupert, do you want to weigh in on that point or shall I move on? Um, I, 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 gosh, I, no, I, I really think the, 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 body, uh, the, the body captures that. I, I, I think what was in my mind right now is, is in, in respect to Biden administration uh, uh, policy on Taiwan, yes, there's disquiet in Taiwan about the practical application of it. And certainly I, I, I take the, the opinion that there's time for rhetoric and there's time for action. And as Bonnie absolutely correctly uh, noted earlier on in her comments, um, sometimes it's important to be discreet, but sometimes you have to be quite public about what you're doing. Um, and, and one of those reasons is the Chinese would actually be much happier if we did everything and just kept it quiet um, because they don't have to deal with it publicly. So it is, it's enormously important to do things publicly from time to time, as Bonnie notes, and for those that from time to time for those things to be new, um, so that there is a sense of, of, of forward movement. I would be thrilled if the Biden administration over the next four years, for the most part, simply managed what they have inherited and was very much encouraged by Mr. Blinken's comments. Um, I'll bet to an audience he knew what he was doing when he when he was talking to Congress, because there's a bipartisan support isn't just some, you know riff that people throw off it's very deep and very much true it's there is no uh, very little space between democrats and republicans on taiwan policy in congress um when he the, there was quite a lot of sort of breathless coverage over um the announcement that the there was the, the board was going to be scrubbed on um government to government engagement and in fact uh, to credit the uh, um trump administration they had already been implementing changes to the way in which we uh, uh, um, engage uh, when Beacon Shao, the new ambassador, had arrived, she was able to go in and, and see Assistant Secretary Stilwell in his office. Um, the outgoing ambassador, Stanley Gao, super chap, he was able to go and say goodbye in the office. Um, even though the announcement was late in the game, the 11th hour, as a practical matter, the, 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 the State Department had already been implementing some of the changes. And it was a two year process that they went through. Um, and Mr. Blinken, absolutely rightly, and to his credit, said, look, this is an opportunity not a burden. And I, 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 those are my words, but that's in essence what he said. And um, I, I really hope he feels that way. Uh, there's no reason to doubt that he doesn't. And that um, he will then look to build on um, what he has inherited as opposed to, to bin it because it came from um, um, his, his predecessor. So I, 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 I'm aspirationally, I'm very much hoping for Okay, so uh, we're getting a tight on time here, but thanks for that. But I want to, um, well, a couple of things. One is just, I don't think it's telling too many tales out of school from the task force, but one of the things that we grappled with was where does the line lie between what are disparaged as symbolic gestures that are potentially provocative without having any substance and things that really should be done to signal support. Uh, you know, a lot of they aren't, the, them aren't terribly tangible. They are things like statements and meetings and such. And that's a very fine, uh, line uh, to, to walk. And I think uh, for people who delve into the report, they'll see, uh, I think, some parsing of which recommendations uh, stay on this side of, of, of the line. Um, we have several uh, questions in the Q&A chat that I, I think can be bundled together, including one from our former president of FBRI, Alan Luxembourg, uh, that essentially say, look, a lot of Taiwan policy, a lot of US policy toward Taiwan, particularly on the security side, it really depends on an assessment of how threatening China is being. Uh, and so you know, the question is, how do you evaluate the China threat? And there's, I guess, several pieces to that. One is the extent to which China has gotten more assertive. Uh, secondly, the extent to which China has gotten more impatient. There's a question in the chat box about how much Xi Jinping considers this a legacy issue. He'd like to be for Taiwan what Deng Xiaoping was for Hong Kong, you know, to set up the, uh, the reversion. Um, and I guess thirdly, the, the methods that Beijing is using. I mean, a lot of the strategic ambiguity policy has been premised on this notion of you're trying to deter kinetic warfare. And the question is, is it really set up to deal with gray zone things that go up to the edge, but not over political warfare, interference in domestic politics and things like that. So several pieces there, but how bad is the China threat? Which parts are most worrisome? 
Uh, and how does that influence your views about what the U.S. should be doing in its Taiwan policy? All of that in five minutes or less. <laughs> <laughs> That's a huge set of uh, questions, Jack. So let me uh, just uh, make a, a, a few points. Uh, China's uh, threat to Taiwan is growing. It's, uh, it's disinformation, it's uh, cyber, it's um, uh, political influence operations, it's uh, um, uh, even uh, efforts, um, of it's, it's purchasing of the media, uh, for example. And, and, and then of course, there's the whole set of military uh, operations where we see Chinese aircraft uh, flying far more frequently inside the air defense identification zone of Taiwan, as well as um, crossing the center line of the Taiwan Strait um, uh, fairly frequently, which it hadn't done for 20 years, but resumed in uh, at the end of March of 2019. Um, and building capabilities, of course, uh, to uh, potentially uh, attack Taiwan uh, or uh, to take one of the outer islands or the uh, uh, Pratas or Dongsha Islands in the, in, in the South China Sea. Uh, so I, I, there's, the, the, the threat is real um, and it is growing and, and China has a huge toolbox and it's ever expanding. We saw that when China announced uh, that uh, it was um, uh, going to take actions potentially against airlines if they referred uh, to uh, Taiwan as uh, not as part of China, but as a separate entity on their websites. Uh, so, I mean, there's, there's a, 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 num a lot of things that, uh, that China does, including punishing other countries that, uh, that don't respect China's core interests on Taiwan. Uh, and we just saw that with the announcement, of course, uh, yesterday of visa restrictions on some of the Trump administration officials who advocated close relations with, with Taiwan. So the threat is real. I don't think that um, uh, Xi Jinping actually um, uh, believes that um, reunification has to be achieved while he was in while he is in power. I think that it is essential for the Chinese Communist Party to deter Taiwan independence. Um, and for the time being, um, and I believe that the Standing Committee uh, Politburo member Wang Yang said uh, just the other day that time is still on China's side. That's debated in China. Interesting that he said that. I think the signal is, is the, stop debating this. Time is on our side because we don't want at this particular moment to undertake uh, something like an invasion of Taiwan that could damage Chinese other interests and set back its course of, uh, uh, of national rejuvenation, which Xi Jinping has said does have to be achieved by uh, 2049. So I think that yes, Xi Jinping would like to make some progress. He wants to ensure the trend is in the right direction. There are concerns about that. Um, and uh, he probably would like to start political talks uh, with Taiwan. Uh, but to say that his legacy, while he is in power, and we don't know whether he's going to remain in power for the, his entire life, uh, he probably will get a third term in 2022. And then after five years, I think the jury is still out as to whether or not uh, Xi Jinping stays in power. Uh, but regardless, he's not going to be in power in 2049. And, and so I've actually heard some Chinese say, you know, he's, he's going to be dead. This is, this is not a deadline that anybody else is going to really in, in, in inherit. And indeed, um, many Chinese say that he's not set a deadline that um, Taiwan must be reunified by 2049. He has said it's inevitable. But frankly, many of the things that Xi Jinping has said about Taiwan have been said by prior leaders. Uh, so we, yes, we see some impatience. Xi Jinping has said, for example, we shouldn't pass down these cross strait problems from generation to generation. But to my mind, that is not a deadline. And so that's, that's just my view. I know there are others uh, who believe that uh, this 2049 deadline is more important. Regardless, um, uh, Xi Jinping is more um, risk tolerant um, and he is willing to take actions to punish Taiwan. Um, and, and, and that I think has been quite harmful to Taiwan's security. And I think that that may very well get worse going forward. And okay, we're really up against our, uh, our time here, Rupert. If you have a very brief uh, last comment, you get the last word. I'll be super. I'll throw it back to Raleigh. I think when you ask what parts are most uh, worrisome, I think that you know beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Um, if I'm China, I'm deeply concerned about the demographic trends on Taiwan in respect to the direction that people are, people are going in, in respect to their view on Taiwan sovereignty. Um, in that regard, 
I think Bonnie's, Bonnie's brilliant point about uh, uh, what's going on in China, and no one's better positioned than she to, to comment on that, um, is, is that, that, uh, that I, perhaps they don't have as much time as they think they do on Taiwan anyway, in respect to how the Taiwanese see Taiwan sovereignty and, and the prospect for some sort of uh, uh, um, uh, reconciliation is the wrong word, but accommodation, thank you, that's the word I, I, I think that, that's right. Um, so I do, I do worry about that. And as we head towards a 2024 election in Taiwan, that will, and there, you know, the United States isn't the only place where, um, you know, there are fisticuffs and, 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 and poor behavior. Um, we, 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 we see that. And for those of us who do Taiwan on a regular basis, it's, they, these are hard fought elections and the tensions will be extremely high in the run up to that. And China will be watching very closely on what they can learn and, and whether or not the outcome of that election will move their political goals closer or in their view uh, further away. Um, just a couple of other things on, on worrisome trends in respect to China. Uh, Bonnie obviously touched on the poll mill sort of side of that. On the econ side, um, uh, intellectual property theft, uh, the, the migration of personnel with trade secrets into China and, and the impact that that's having in, in, on, on business, um, how it impacts the commercial relationship between China and Taiwan, but also China's position in the global supply chain. Um, economically, um, that, that's a significant concern. Um, and, and just sort of an outlier issue, but I, I really want to flag it uh, just as my last thought here. The Chinese did an extremely effective job um, in the late 90s uh, through permanent normal trade relations and China's accession to the WTO in creating a community of, in of interest here in the States amongst the business community on the importance of engagement with China and moderating policies um, to create the right conditions for good relations. I think I've got the nomenclature right. Um, how, how do the Chinese see now uh, in a more permissive environment with Mr. Biden? And I think we are moving into a more permissive environment of US-China relations. How do they see engaging the US business community in respect to a more permissive environment where the US business community may feel that they want to start focusing more on advocating a, a more positive relationship with China? And how do those synergies play with, with, uh, with Chinese behavior? I'm, I, I hope I'm not being too cryptic, but um, I, I, I'm very interested to see how the US business community uh, 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 readjusts itself for a more permissive environment in US-China relations and, and, and how that, that plays. Anyway, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thanks, thanks, John. Well, thank you. Thank you both. And thank everyone. I thank everyone for joining us today. There's a lot to chew on there. We could keep going for a long time, but we try not to let these things go too far uh, over, over time limits. I would say that it is curious that we now live in a time where when uh, an incumbent's second uh, term, uh, or next term, what, what term has just begun, we're talking about looking back on their next term. Uh, Xi Jinping, does he get a, a fourth term beyond the expected third term? Uh, we're talking about Taiwan 2024 elections, and Jen Psaki got asked yesterday if Biden and filed for re-election yet. So we're all uh, champing at the bit to see what happens in the next few years. I'm glad we're able to close on a note about Taiwan domestic politics, which looms very large in this. Uh, there is this generational turnover that Rupert alluded to as well, uh, that there's a younger generation that sees itself as naturally independent, which complicates uh, the winning hearts and minds approach uh, to, to pressing for unification. Uh, and we did see a couple of elections here, particularly the most recent election, where uh, a too accommodating policy toward the mainland was not a political winner uh, in, in Taiwan's um, election. So a ton to chew on there. We've run over time. I thank you all for staying with us. I thank very much uh, Bonnie Glazer and Rupert Hammond Chambers for joining us today for a really rich discussion. Uh, you can find the report from CSIS and the link that's in the, uh, in the chat function here. You can also uh, find a link to the recording if this all went by so fast or you tuned in partway through or you just want to share it with your friends. Uh, thank, you, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. And I'll throw it back to Raleigh to close this out. Uh, thank you very much, Jacques, Bonnie, and Rupert. Terrific discussion. Um, one important announcement before I, I let everybody loose, and that is if you enjoyed this event and this discussion, there will be more on the 29th of January. It's a Friday at 10 a.m. Uh, we will be hosting Taiwan's new representative to the U.S. as of July 20th. Uh, she is a new representative, Bai Kim Tsao. And she'll be also talking about U.S.-Taiwan relations under the Biden administration. Um, and a couple of other, other coming attractions I feel compelled to also let you know about. On the 26th of January, we'll be having um, former 
Ambassador John Campbell talking about his new book, uh, Nigeria and the Nation State. Those of you who are our Africa watchers know how important Nigeria is to the continent. And uh, so bear that in mind. It's on our uh, FPR website if you want additional details. And again, on Thursday the 28th, we're also going to be having a discussion uh, with our own Ron Granieri and a Bob Kaplan talking about his new book that's just been published, The Good American, The Epic Life of Bob Gersoni, the U.S. government's greatest humanitarian. So please tune us in again. Uh, thank you again for your support. Um, all the best to you and your families. Stay well and take care.